because the hypocrites are, for they love to pray standing in the synagogues and in the corners of the streets, that they may be seen of men. Verily I say unto you, they have their reward. But thou, when thou prayest, enter into thy closet, and when thou hast shut thy door, pray to thy Father which is in secret, and thy Father which seeth in secret shall reward thee openly. But when ye pray, use not vain repetitions as the heathen do, for they think that they shall be heard for their much speaking. Be not ye therefore lack unto them, for your Father knoweth what things ye have need of before ye ask him. After this manner, therefore, pray ye. Our Father, which art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done in earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our debts, as we forgive our debtors. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, and the power, and the glory, forever. Amen. I'm using this last word in verse 13 as the subject. As the world turns, the young and the restless are on a search for tomorrow. They are looking for another world. They live their lives one day at a time on the edge of night. And they are searching for the guiding light. But I'm convinced that they don't know where it is. You know, a sermon should do at least four things for you. One, it should stretch your mind. It should inform you. It should instruct you. Then two, it should tan your hide. It should correct you. Three, it should warm your heart. It should inspire you. Four, it should provoke the will. It should challenge you to do what the Lord would have you do. Now every one of us has a check made out on the bank of heaven. But many fail to cash it at the window of prayer. Now prayer is man's job. That's the only unending obligation that our Lord has given to men. He did not say that men ought to always work. He did not say that men ought to always play. But men ought always to pray. We're to pray for our personal lives. We're to pray when you are successful, lest you become selfish. Pray when you are in sorrow, lest you become cynical. Pray when you are in prosperity, lest you become proud. Pray 
when you're in poverty, lest you become spiritually poor, and that's the worst kind of poverty. Uh, prayer is perplexingly paradoxical. That is, you have to pray in order to pray. When the disciples of Jesus saw how lacking they were in prayer, they prayed, Lord, teach us. And notice, they didn't say, Lord, teach us to preach, or Lord, teach us to work miracles, or Lord, teach us to be wise, but Lord, teach us to pray. Some people think that prayer is a monologue where you do all the talk. And some of us talk to the Lord just like he doesn't know what's happening in this world. We talk to the Lord like we have to inform him. We have to tell him what's happening down here. And then... Sometimes we talk to the Lord like we are picketing the throne of grace. We're trying to get him to change his mind. He's reluctant to answer us. And we, we've got to keep calling him. Giving him orders. Tell him what we want him to do. Where we want him to go. And when we want it done. And it's usually right now. Right now Lord. Right now. But prayer is not just a monologue where you do all the talk. Prayer is a dialogue. Not only must you talk to God, but you've got to wait and let Him talk to you. Now it's far better for us to hear what the Lord has to say than it is for Him to hear what we have to say. Praise ye the Lord. I will praise the Lord with my whole heart in the assembly of the upright. Now praise for worship is due God. We are here tonight to glory in his grace, to meditate on his might and his mercy, and to put his praises before our petition. You know, if we would just thank the Lord for what he has done and what he is doing, we wouldn't ask him for so much. Instead of counting your bruises, spend some time counting your blessings. We're good at counting bruises. Poor me, I have one here. <laughs> I have one day. But spend some time counting your blessings. Of course, I don't do too well with an accurate account because I soon get on shouting ground and I lose the count. Instead of lamenting over what you've lost, thank God for what you have left. Instead of numbering your enemies, thank God that you have some friends. And I thank him that I have a friend above all others in Jesus Christ. Let's praise the Lord. Thank him for what he is doing. You know, I used to whine and murmur and complain. Everybody was holding me down. Everybody was down on me. Everybody was mistreating me. But when I found Jesus precious to my soul, I moved off of Complaint Avenue, and I'm now living on Thanksgiving Boulevard. <laughs> Praise ye the Lord. Now, prayer is a great privilege of redeemed souls. It's a privilege, it's a blessing for every one of us just to be here tonight. This is a great privilege. 
don't you know, just to have your health and your strength enough to make it here, that's a privilege. We ought to thank him for it. Everything I have above nothing, everything I have, the Lord gave it to me. So I thank him. Prayer is not only a great privilege, but prayer is a weapon in the hour of conflict. It's a defense in the moment of peril. And it's a retreat in the seasons of exhaustion. Oh, I said I was going to talk about amen. All right. Amen simply means that which is certain, that which is credible, that which is true. Amen simply means so be it. As it is in thy purposes, as it is in thy promises, so be it in our prayers, so be it in our praises. Now in the Old Testament, there are at least 30 references to Amen. In the New Testament, there are at least 50 references to Amen. And in every one of these references, you will find that Amen is a word of affirmation. It has the force of a superlative and it has a note of finality. When you've said it, you have said it and there's just nothing else you can say to talk. Amen. The best thing you can do is repeat it. And don't knock repetition. Every once in a while I'll preach a sermon at Calvary uh, that I've preached before and invariably somebody will come up after the meeting and say, Preacher, I heard that one before. And I say, yes, and if it didn't bear repeating, I shouldn't have preached it in the first place. <laughs> Don't knock repetition. There are no degrees of holiness. God is just holy. He's not less holy one day and more holy another day. He's just holy. In the year that King Uzziah died, I saw the Lord high and lifted up. And his train filled the temple. And above him stood the seraphim, and each one had six wings. With twain he covered his face, with twain he covered his feet, and with twain he did fly. And one cried unto another, and said holy and I get the idea that the one in the north cried holy and the one in the south tried to find something better to say and he couldn't come up with it and he cried holy the one in the east tried to find something to top it he couldn't he cried holy the one in the west cried holy holy is the Lord of hosts Amen simply means yes Lord and everybody here tonight ought to say yes to the Lord everybody here to just let the Lord have his way in your life just think what would happen right here tonight if every one of us would just let the Lord have his way. Why revival would break out right here and spread throughout the length and breadth of this country. Let the Lord have his way. If you let the Lord have his way, you'll not only see what the Lord can do for you, but what he can do with you and through you. 
Now, nothing important is going to happen through you until something happens to you. Let the Lord have his way. Amen is an indication of solemn assent to the words of another on the part of an individual or an assembly. It was used in the synagogues. It is passed on to usage in the Christian congregation. It was customary to use amen at the giving of thanks. Our Lord used amen when he got ready to vest the statement with special authority. He would often say, truly, truly, I say unto you. Verily, verily, I say unto you. Simply, amen, amen, I say unto you. The title, Amen, was given to our Lord in the epistle to the church at Laodicea. Paul preached about Christ, the Amen, the seal of God's promises. In all of these references, every time you hear somebody praising the Lord, if he's your Lord, you say Amen. Amen makes a doxology what it is. When you recognize the truth, you say amen. Even in Ezra's time, when the scriptures were read, all of the people said amen. I don't mean some of them, all of the people said amen. You know, we think that amen is for people who don't know any better. But I've come to tell you it is for people who do know better. You know, in my first uh, five years of preaching ministry, I, I used to walk in and tell the congregation, let's say amen, church. I hadn't said anything, but I'm, uh, amen for what? Uh, say it again. But you know, I soon learned better than that. I don't want to encourage anybody to be a hypocrite. If the Lord is not your shepherd, don't play like it. If you don't recognize the truth, just stay quiet. <laughs> Amen is for people who know. Paul in talking to the Corinthians about spiritual gifts, Paul said, God will give an individual what he wants him to have. He'll give you something that he does not give me, and he'll give me something that he does not give you. And he said, especially you people uh, who call yourselves speaking in tongues. He said, now I'm not trying to negate the fact that the Lord is able to cause a man to speak another language on the spot. I'm not talking about some babbling. You don't know what you're talking about and no one else. And if we ask you what you are saying... Then you get angry and go to talking about you are of the devil. And Paul said, if you insist in speaking in tongues, you get an interpreter. So how can these people say amen when they don't know what you're talking about? All of the people will say amen. All right, Paul uh, preached and he talked about Christ, who is God's Amen. You know, our sophistication is sapping the life out of our religion. We work hard, yes, we do. We work hard at being dignified. You know, when we come to worship, our dignity comes down on us hard and heavy. We, uh, 
want to act like somebody else acts. We want to sound like somebody else sounds. But when does the Lord have His way? I tell you, when you quench the Spirit, you grieve the Holy Spirit. You know, amen will work anywhere if you'll allow it. Now I know what I'm talking about. In 1970, in the month of March, that is March the 15th, I was one of ten preachers from across this nation to be invited by the President of the United States to be his guest in the White House. Now I used to love to tell this before Watergate. And that morning, that Sunday morning, we were among 360 dignitaries from around the world. I'm talking about heads of state. There was more dignity there for a square inch than you could have found anywhere in the world. <laughs> Just about as long as we could. And we let loose with amen. And we had a shouting good time in the East Room of the White House. The next morning, the Washington Post had its headlines, Amen, sounded in the White House. It'll work, it'll work anywhere, if you'll allow. But some people, some people will try to justify themselves for not using it by saying, well, I don't know whether to use it at the beginning, in the middle, or at the end. And you know, I don't like to interrupt. I just like to sit and listen. Don't you know you can't interrupt a God-called preacher by saying amen? If you believe it, you try. And then some try to justify themselves by saying, well, I don't know whether to pronounce it amen or amen. You know, we can become so technical when it comes to things spiritual. You're not misleading me. You are intelligent enough to know how to, or when to pronounce T-H-E, the, and when to pronounce it the. You know to say it the east and the west. But what does it matter? The Lord is listening to how you pronounce your words. If some of us had to be saved on our pronunciation, we never would make it. But the Lord is looking at the condition of your heart. And then there are some who say, well, amen, it's just something some people have picked up and it really doesn't mean anything, and uh, I wish they'd leave it alone. I heard a man some time ago said, there's an old brother in our church just says amen so loud and so frequently it just turns me off. Well, don't you know if somebody else puts too much seasoning on his food, that isn't going to keep me from seasoning my food to my taste. And then... Let's see if it's something that we can easily leave out. Lord say, when you pray, when you pray. I'm not talking about uh, get up reciting some words. You know, we have a habit of going visiting. And we'll hear somebody use certain uh, words and expressions in his prayer, say certain things. And we'll make a mental note of it. When we get back home, we'll say the same thing that we heard somebody else say. I'm not talking about vain repetition. I'm not talking about reciting some words. Jesus said, when you pray, pray after this manner. When you pray pray after this matter. And some of us get tripped up right there. We start arguing. Some over here will say, the Lord simply meant for you uh, to recite these words verbatim. 
Somebody over here will say, no, he didn't mean that. He wants you to recite these words and then close out with something of your own. And somebody over here will say, no, he didn't mean that. He simply means for you to say something of your own, and when you have said it, then close out by saying something like this. Lord, teach us to pray as John also taught his disciples. And then we go in and recite these words. But Jesus said, when you pray, pray after this manner. Now, when I was in the elementary school, I was taught to add, subtract, multiply, and divide. And then they gave me some problems. And before every set of problems, they would give me some examples to show me how to work the problems. And that didn't mean that all of the numbers that you encounter uh, in the problem was going to be the same numbers as in the example. But whatever numbers you come across, work it after this manner. And then along about that time, we were taught letter writing. And we were taught that any good letter had to have at least six parts. In the first place, you had to have the name of the person to whom you're writing. In this prayer letter, the name is Our Father. Wait a minute, let me say that again. Look, if you're going to pray, you've got to pray Our Father. That means I'm going to have to pray for you, and you're going to have to pray for me. If God is your father, and I know he's mine, that makes us brothers. I'm glad I've got brothers of all colors and kinds. You know, a man is not going to accept another man as brother until he recognizes that they both have the same father. Our Father. And then we were taught you had to have the address of the person to whom you're writing. And then we go to think about God sitting way off out somewhere. He's an absentee God. We have to call him to tell him to come here, go out to the hospital, go out in California and see about my children. Oh. We can send him on so many errands. And go and do this and do the other. Come here, go yonder. Look, distance has no meaning to God. That's that other fella who has to go to and fro. The Lord is already here. He's everywhere here. That other fella had to catch him a ride. You had to bring him. But our Lord is already here. Don't need him telling him, come on and be in this meeting. He's here. You just <laughs> open up your heart and become aware of his presence. He's here. He's got nowhere to go. He's everywhere here. And then we were taught that there's a greeting or salutation. The greeting or salutation depends upon what you think about the one to whom you're writing. Brother, if you're writing to Mary and you're just a casual friend with Mary, you are satisfied to say, Dear Mary. But if you really love Mary, you will spend about an hour and a half trying to find a name sweeter than the name Mary. Now you know what a name is. Go on and put it down there. The greeting of salutation in this prayer letter is hallowed be thy name. This name is holy. This name is excellent. Oh, I get impatient with people who claim to be Christian and when they get ready to swear and use vulgarity and profanity they reach and get that holy name and drag it down through the field this name is to be respected this name is to be hallowed don't you know 
There's no other name under heaven given among men whereby we must be saved. Don't you know there's no other name you can pray in? Don't you know there's not another name you can meet in? Hallowed be thy name. And then we were taught that when you begin the body of the letter, always express some interest in the one to whom you're writing. Those of us who've been away from home, possibly in school, and we needed some money, it didn't take us long to ask about the other sisters and brothers and aunts and uncles, and then tell them to send you a hundred dollars. Always express some interest in the one to whom you're writing. We to start this prayer let off by saying, Thy kingdom come. Thy will be done in earth as it is in heaven. And then when you've expressed some interest in him, then go on and ask him for what you want. Give us this day our daily bread. And forgive us our debts as we forgive our debtors. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. And then we were taught that there is a complimentary close. And the complimentary close differs from the greeting or salutation in that now you can't figure out who you are. You'll get down and you'll say, I am your. I am your. You know who you are and you know what you are. Don't put it down there. But you say, I am your. And then when you finally arrive at it, you will say yours always or forever and ever and ever. And you'll underscore it two or three times and put some exclamation points there. Now you, you may be, uh, you might change your mind tomorrow, but for now it's forever. The complimentary close in this prayer letter is thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever. Thine is the kingdom. Now who ever heard of a kingdom without a king? Everybody has got a king. Who is your king? I ask you who your king is and you want to know who mine is. All right, you got a minute? My king is one who will let you know who's who and what's what. I told you about uh, my being invited to the White House. Now that may not mean a thing to you. Now that might be an everyday occurrence to you to get to be invited by the President of the United States to be his guest in the White House. But for a black boy born up here in Robertson County, they thought he was retarded, they said he would never amount to anything. Oh, the Lord picked me up. The Lord build me up and fill me up and save me and then make a preacher out of me and then have the President of the United States to invite me to be his guest. Well, that meant something to me. And about two months after then, everybody I'd talk with, I'd weave the conversation around <laughs> to let them know I'd been to the White House. Oh, I'd tell them how good I felt being guarded by the same security officers as the President of the United States. I told them how good I felt sitting there talking with the President for three hours and fifteen minutes. Oh, I told them how good I felt. But I say, my king will let you know who's who and what's what. Now that was in March when I was in the White House. And in September that same year, I was in Rome. And the president was scheduled to be in Rome two days after I was to depart. And I said, now I'll just rearrange my itinerary 
And I'll just be here when my king comes. I'll be here when my president comes. Now, I didn't think I'd get to see him, but I just want to have it said that I was in Rome at the same time the president was. And while I was going around sightseeing, I saw a letter on the wall, Nixon, Rome will be your grave. I said, uh oh, I got out of there and went on down in Africa. Well, I found out, I found out uh, that uh, my king couldn't do me any good in certain circumstances and in under certain conditions. And that made me draw close to my son of king. My king is the only one qualified to be king. You know, all these other kings were born a prince. And he had to wait until his father died, or wait until the mother, if she was a ruling monarch, wait until she died, and then he became king. Whoa, but my king has always been king. Well, he was king before existence. I know what I'm talking about. I'm talking about uh, uh, he was before existence. He's the one that got existence started. I'm talking about uh, uh, my king, who's older than his mother, and just as old as his father. I'm talking about my king. He's the only one qualified to be king. My king was born king. The Bible says he's a seven-way king. He's a king of the Jews. That's a racial king. He's a king of Israel. That's a national king. He's a king of righteousness. He's a king of the ages. He's a king of heaven. He's a king of glory. He's a king of kings. And he is a lord of lords. Now that's my king. Well, I wonder if you know him. Do you know him? Don't try to mislead me. Do you know my king? David said the heavens declare the glory of God and the fundament showeth his handiwork. My king is the only one whom there no means of measure can define his limitless love. No far-seeing telescope can bring into visibility the coastline of his shoreless supplies. No barriers can hinder him from pouring out his blessing. Well, well, he's enduringly strong. He's entirely sincere. He's eternally steadfast. He's immortally graceful. He's imperially powerful. He's impartially merciful. That's my king. He's God's son. He's a sinner's savior. He's the centerpiece of civilization. He stands alone in himself. He's august. He's unique. He's unparalleled. He's unprecedented. He's supreme. He's preeminent. Well, he's the loftiest idea in literature. He's the highest personality in philosophy. He's the supreme problem in high criticism. He's the fundamental doctrine of true theology. He's the cardinal necessity of spiritual religion. And that's my king. He's the miracle of the age. He's the superlative of everything good that you choose to call him. Well, he, he's the only one able to supply all of our needs simultaneously. He supplies strength for the weak. He's available for the tempted and the tried. He sympathizes and he saves. He star gods and he guides. He heals the sick. He cleanses the lepers. He forgives sinners. He discharges debtors. And he delivers the captives. He defends the feeble. He blesses the young. He serves the unfortunate. He regards the age. He rewards the diligent. And he beautifies... Praise. 
king of wisdom. He's a doorway of deliverance. He's a pathway of peace. He's a roadway of righteousness. He's a highway of holiness. He's a gateway of glory. He's a master of the mighty. He's a captain of the conquerors. He's the head of the heroes. He's the leader of the legislators. He's the overseer of the overcomers. He's the governor of governors. He's the prince of princes. He's the king of kings. And he's the lord of lords. That's my king. Yeah. Yeah. That's my king. My king. Yeah. His office is manifold. His promise is sure. His life is matchless. His goodness is limitless. His mercy is everlasting. His love never changes. His word is enough. His grace is sufficient. His reign is righteous. His yoke is easy and his burden is light. Well, I wish I could describe him to you, but he, he's indescribable. He's indescribable. He's incomprehensible. He's invincible. He's irresistible. I'm trying to tell you, the heavens of heavens cannot contain him, let alone a man explaining him. You can't get him out of your mind. You can't get him off of your hand. You can't outlive him, and you can't live without him. Well, Pharisees couldn't stand him, but they found out they couldn't stop him. Pilate couldn't find any fault in him. The witnesses couldn't get their testimonies to agree. And Herod couldn't kill him. Death couldn't handle him. And the grave couldn't hold him. That's my king. Yeah! He always has been. And he always will be. I'm talking about he had no predecessor. And he'll have no successor. There was nobody before him and there'll be nobody after him. You can't impeach him and he's not going to resign. That's my king. That's my king. Time, time is the kingdom and the power and the glory. All the power belongs to my king. We around here talking about black power and white power and green power, but it's God's power. Thine is the power. Yeah. <laughs> and the glory. We trying to get prestige and honor and glory for ourselves, but the glory is all his. Yeah is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever and ever and ever and ever how long is that and ever and ever and ever and ever and, ever. and when you get through with all of the forever then amen Unless you sign the letter, is not binding. Anybody can type out a letter for me. But if I don't sign it, it's not mine. Or you can say all of that other. But if you don't say amen, if you don't let the Lord have his way in your life, it doesn't mean a thing. You've got to sign the letter, brother, with amen. Now look, we're just having a rehearsal down here. We're practicing down here. What are we going to do when we get on the other side? Now if you can't act right in the rehearsal, you're not going to be in the performance. I wonder how you think you're going to fare when you get to heaven. 
You just want to sit there quietly and say, you're going to get run over. Well, that's going to be moving there. That's going to be noise. That's going to be shouting. Oh, yes. When I was in Southwestern Seminary, they taught me how to stand in the same track. <laughs> they taught me how They taught me how to hold my Bible. They taught me how to gesture to emphasize my points if I had any. They taught me even how to regulate and modulate my voice so it wouldn't be so loud and obnoxious. And you know, I passed the course. But when I get to thinking about the one who saved me, I get excited. I get excited, I tell you. I can't help but get loud. I've got something to shout about. Have you? Well, when I get there, you think I'm going to go somewhere and sit down? <laughs> so, well, I, I made it over. <laughs> what? <Well, I don't. laughs> They'll be shouting. Do you think I'm shouting now? If you think I'm shouting now, you just wait. You just wait until my feet strike Zion. You just wait until I behold the face of the one who saved me. You just wait until I hear him say, servant well done. You know, every once in a while, we have trouble down here trying to find songs that'll suit everybody. If you repeat the same song within a month, you'll hear grumbling all over the congregation. Why don't they sing something else? I don't, I don't like that song. You've got a song and I've got a song and all of God's children got a song. Whoa! But when we get over there, we're going to sing one song. Honor, glory, majesty, power. And then amen, amen, amen. Will you be there? Will you be there? Amen, amen. Will you stand with me with bowed heads? Forget about where you've been. Forget about where you plan to go. Forget about your achievements. Forget about your failures. And just think about your relationship to the Lord Jesus Christ. Some here tonight need to update and upgrade their relationship. Some need to come in closer. And then there are some here who have never trusted, never tried Jesus. I'm testing, asking you to come to him now and just let him have his way in your life. If you let him have his way, he'll give you pardon for your past. He'll give you power for the present and he'll give you a bright prospect for the future. He'll give you a song to sing in the time of sorrow. He'll walk with you and talk with you and tell you that you're his own. If you'll just come to him now, he will undo your past. Yes, he will. He will forgive you of your sins. One thing I like about him, 
You don't have to go and get a long list of references. You just come believing in Him. Come as you are. Receive Him as He is. And His grace will save. And then there are some who say, I'm saved. But you're not serving Him. Rise up and do what the Lord would have you do. And there's no better time than now. You see, we are hung up between the no longer and the not yet. What has been is no longer. What's going to be is not yet. All you have, all you can count on is now. Seek the Lord now while he may be found. Come on now. And then there are some who feel so inadequate. There are some who say, well, I, I, I'm bashful, I'm hesitant, I, I, I don't know the approach, I, I, I don't know what to say. You come on to the Lord and he will give you all that you need because it's in him. If you want strength with which to do his will, he's invited you to come boldly, unashamedly, before the throne of grace, where you might obtain mercy and find grace to help in the time of need. Come on while we say.